This is our next uh, video lecture for Discover Geography. And in this case, again, we're talking about humans and the environment. And I want to introduce the concept of the commons, common property, and what Garrett Hardin called the tragedy of the commons. So first of all, let's begin with some definitions. Uh, we talk about common property resources, or CPRs, as those resources, that aspect of the environment or of ecosystems, that is held in common by a group of people or by a government. So, for example, in the state of Pennsylvania, we have state game lands. So these are areas that everyone has access to, um, but they're controlled to some degree by the state. So that would be a common property resource. It's something that a group of people have some control over, but nobody owns it individual. We can also, and I want to put that in contrast, to private property. Um, I own a home, and my lawn, I can largely do whatever I want out there. I can cut up all of the trees that are mine to cut down, or I can mow the lawn or not mow the lawn to a certain degree. I have the access to those resources, and I gain the benefit from them, and their decline costs me. Common property is shared. Open access resources are those that are truly owned by no one, and in many cases are absolutely not controlled at all. Uh, sunlight is the kind of quintessential example of an open access resource. There is an unlimited amount of sunlight and anyone can capture it over themselves. In other words, I can set up, there's nothing that prevents me from setting up a solar array to catch sunlight. Uh, wind might be the same way. Air in general is considered an open access resource, although Again, in many cases, we've had to deal with that, and we'll get to that in a minute. Now, what Garrett Hardin did in the 1960s is he began to examine the problem of declining quality in these commons. And he kind of looked at both open access resources and common property resources. And he noted that over time, these resources tended to degrade faster than those that were held in private property. And he asked the question, why? And he came up with a pretty reasonable solution. So let's take a look at this a little bit. Um, and a, an example of an open access resource is in fact the high seas. There are kind of laws of the sea that say outside of a, a country's um, near shore environment, the oceans are kind of fair game to anybody. Anyone can go out and pretty much do anything they want. They are an open access. Now, there's a whole bunch of treaties that limit that, but many parts of the ocean, um, and again, if you look at this map, each of these areas in green have some, uh, or in color, have some level of treaty-based control, but a lot of the oceans don't. As a result, those things that can be derived from the open ocean are essentially fair game. Uh, as an example, tuna. Tuna are a type of fish, many of you obviously have eaten tuna, but what we often don't realize is that tuna swim, they, they move across massive amounts of ocean, and oftentimes they're fished for in what we would call open waters. And so the deep waters, the fishing for them in these areas is really very, there's very little control on it. In fact, it's kind of fair game. Now, there's an exception to this, um, that in some of the coastal waters, especially where their spawning areas are, uh, these are controlled areas and very tightly controlled. But the open oceans, not so much. So this would be considered a common resource. And the numbers that you see here are the declines in these fisheries over the last century. And so what we see is that, again, in open commons areas, there's an incredible tendency towards decline and degradation. Now, the question is why? And what Hardin argued was it was a fairly straightforward argument. In a common resource, in other words, everybody gets to take whatever they want, there is a tendency to take as much as you can because all of the benefit goes to you. So again, let's think about this from the standpoint of sheep grazing on public land. In other words, the grass is free. Grass belongs to everybody. If everyone, if everyone just puts a single sheep on there, the sheep is going to graze, the grass is going to be maintained, and the sheep gets fat, sell the sheep at market, 
you make all of the money for that sheep. But remember that the individual that puts the sheep on the free land gains all of the benefit. Now, if I only put one sheep on there, the land is fine. But I'd say, well, wait a minute. If I put two sheep on there, I'm going to make twice as much money. And so I put two sheep on. And another one of the, the ranchers puts two sheep on. But one guy only puts one sheep on. The problem is that the land gets degraded a little bit. Now, instead of making, let's say, $100 a sheep back here, I only make 80 But since I put two sheep on, my profit goes all to me. Now, the one guy, the guy that only put one on, well, instead of getting his $100 because I put two on, he only gets 82 So he loses a little bit. And while I don't get as much per sheep, I actually gain more because I put more sheep on it. And the next time he looks at it and goes, well, I'm not going to let the other people put two sheep on when I'm only going to do my, you know, my bit and put only one on. And so everybody begins to put more sheep on because the benefit goes to the individual and the degradation is shared by everybody. And so there's a race to maximize your profit that drives the quality of the environment down. Now, Hardin saw this in public lands, BLM lands, Bureau of Land Management lands, out west. And that the more the land was not controlled, the more it was degraded. And so what Hardin realized was that public lands tend to decline because people degrade them for personal benefit. The benefit goes to the individual. The degradation is shared by everybody. And so we have to think about that as why this happens. Another great example of this, and this is kind of the last one I want to point out, is the American bison. Now, prior to 1900, essentially the Great Plains, much of this was free land. In other words, nobody owned it. And it is estimated that at this time there were approximately 60 million bison running in the lower 48. As a result, those bison were actually quite valuable during this time for their fur, for their, for their pelts, uh, for meat, and, and most notably, oddly enough, for their tongue. Bison tongue was something that everybody wanted. So what happened was that individuals, groups, would go out to the West and they would hunt as many bison as they could because there was no limit on it. It was a common resource. Bison were hunted. Bison were hunted. And the benefit came to the individuals that hunted them. The degradation of the herd was shared by everyone. As a result, by 1900, that 60 million bison had been reduced to 300 because everybody was desperate to get the last part of it. And so again, that is the problem, is there's a race to the bottom in a common property resource. Okay, so what do we do? Well, Hardin argued for two ways of doing this. One was quite simply to privatize everything. If you own it, you're gonna take care of it. Or what is often called the the carrot, and that is what we call government, and the, the term he used was coercion, but those are regulations. In other words, we have a Clean Water Act, a Clean Air Act, because that was the only way to maintain air quality. In other words, everyone had free access there, so everyone pushed their contaminants out into it. If you don't own it, you have to regulate it. At least that's Hardin's argument. Okay, we'll pick this up on the next lecture. We'll see you then.